All right. Uh, thanks to those of you who uh, are joining us here today for the 10 Daily Sins of Charity Auctions. just want to give people another 60 seconds or so to, uh, to log into the webinar, and then we will get started here. Looking forward to it. All righty. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for the 10 Deadly Sins of Charity Auctions and how to prevent them. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items uh, before we get started here. Uh, all attendees are going to be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, we have, we're not going to distribute the slides for the webinar, but a video version will be sent out via email, so look out for that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and type them into the toolbar that you have over the right side. And then we're going to have a full Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, you, you can live tweet us at WinspireMe or at CooperDanny using the hashtag 10 Deadly Sins uh, to get in touch with us that way. And I think we should have a couple couple additional housekeeping items in. We should have like no smoking or drinking during the webinar. And also, please do not make direct eye contact with right. us during the seminar. And finally, please, for your own safety, remain seated throughout the entire webinar. Yes, safety, safety is always a first. Here. Absolutely. Yeah, right. So uh, just a couple other things before we get started, and I'll introduce that fine gentleman here in uh, just a second. Um, so this is actually part of a two-part series. Uh, we This is typically a you know a one- or two-day-long seminar that Danny Hooper gives that we're trying to condense down into a 45-minute webinar. So uh, we are going a lot more in-depth. Uh, this is one of two webinars. The second one's going to be coming up on June 22nd. So we'll be sending out a, a free registration link for that as well. Uh, so definitely look out for that. It's going to be about generating record profits for your fundraising event. We're just going to go more in depth. And then also, uh, just as a free gift to those of you, and, and to encourage you guys to stick around for the length of the webinar, we're going to be giving away just a, a list of 400 plus amazing auction item ideas for you guys and your brainstorming. Uh, and we're going to give you that link at the end of the webinar. So just to uh, introduce us here today, uh, my name is Ian Loth. I'm the creative director here at Winspire. Um, and we are very proud, very happy to welcome our good friend Danny Hooper, auctioneer, author, entertainer, and uh, personality extraordinaire. Uh, Danny Hooper, welcome. Thank you very much, Ian. I'll tell you, it's uh, such a delight and pleasure to be here at the Winspire headquarters in Laguna Hills, California. I love coming to Southern California. I make my uh, home up in... Uh, Vancouver Island, the beautiful city of Victoria is where Brenda and I live, and my office is actually based in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, so nice to be down here in Southern California, and where's the sunshine? That's that's what, I talked to Brenda this morning, she said it's sunny and hot in Victoria, and we've got clouds here. And it's, crazy. Cloud, it's cloudy here in Southern California today. Uh, I wish you brought the sun with you. <laughs> anyway, all right, we've got lots of ground to cover. Uh, just want to say to those who registered for the webinar, but perhaps were not able to uh, join us, Yes, uh, like I said, we're going to be sending out a video recording, so if you have anyone that you want to send these slides to, send the webinar to, uh, you won't be like these dinosaurs here, you'll be uh, A-OK, -okay. we'll send that your way. All right, well, as Ian said, my name is Danny Hooper. I have been a uh, fundraising auctioneer since 1987, so approaching my 30th anniversary. Uh, this is the only area of the auction industry that I have ever worked in. I have never sold a cow or never sold an automobile outside of a charity auction. We now conduct about 100 to 120 special events a year, so feel that I have lots of uh, experience in this area. And today, we're very excited to share what we have called the 10 deadly sins of a fundraising auction event. We're going to be going through the 10 most common mistakes that I see fundraising event organizers uh, do over and over again. And these are mistakes that could be extremely costly. So we'll touch on the 10 deadly sins. We'll have a very quick uh, discussion on how to prevent the 10 deadly sins. As well, the goal and objective here today is to give you some real money-making tools that you can take away at the end of this webinar great money uh, makers, revenue generators, that even if you're having an auction this weekend, you'll be able to implement a lot of these ideas. Ian and I were speaking yesterday, and uh, Ian asked what the most interesting live auction item was that uh, I have sold in my near 30 years, and uh, there's been lots of interesting things, but one of the most interesting things I had an opportunity to sell a couple of years ago was for the David Foster Foundation, 
we were doing a big gala in Toronto, and I do want to mention that we serve clients of every scope and, and size. We do the smallest little sports organizations and school groups on up to the big galas, but this was as big as they get, this David Foster Foundation event, and the featured entertainer that night was none other than Andrea Bocelli. I'm sure Barbara liked that one. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. And I'll tell you, all the women loved uh, Andrea Bocelli. He made the most interesting auction donation that night. He donated two tickets on a private jet to fly to Florence, Italy, with he and his wife, and to stay with them in their home wow. for four nights. And that sold to a woman in the front row for $175,000. We did close to $3 million that night. It was a huge event. I was flying home the next day thinking to myself, my gosh, I've got to start charging commission. <laughs> and a couple of nights later, I found myself in a church basement doing a church auction trying to get $38 for six rings of garlic sausage. So, big spectrum events. Big yeah. spectrum events, <laughs> I do. But I'll tell you what, I have, uh, in all the years I've been doing the fundraising auctions, I, I feel I've learned a lot. I'm absolutely passionate about what I do, and I feel so blessed to be able to do what I do and work with so many wonderful nonprofit organizations. But to me, it's been a tremendous source of frustration to see event planners that commit these 10 deadly sins. And the worst thing is to see how hard volunteers work organizing their events, sometimes working many months, maybe a year in advance, to solicit auction items. Uh, they get the venue booked to sell tickets to their event. They fill the room with, with guests. And what breaks my heart is to see lots of times a bunch of money come into that room and then turn and leave at the end of the night because of these 10 deadly sins. So we're going to be touching on those. I got so frustrated, I finally sat down here just over a year ago and put the best of my learnings and, and my knowledge and all of the great ideas I've seen out there from some of the best run events in North America. And I compiled all of these learnings into a, a book. I call the book Easy Money, How to Generate Record Profits at Your Next Fundraising Auction Event. It's just a tremendous resource, and, and uh, we'll uh, tell you about that a little later on this morning. Also, Ian, I'm delighted to be partnered up now with Winspire on a very, very special project that uh, we are going to be releasing next month. Correct. Yeah, it's called Checklist Builder. It takes um, all the things we're talking about here today in this webinar, everything in Danny's book, all those resources that you see on Winspire News um, that we're coming out with, and it puts it all together in one easy-to-use tool. So that's coming out real soon, uh, just in time for the next webinar, so definitely look out for that. Yeah, and very quickly, it's a web-based app that uh, has pre-populated checklists, so you can go exactly. through and check off, make sure you're not uh, missing any opportunities, and that nothing's falling through the cracks. You know, event planners face an awful lot of challenges. Uh, and it's not easy organizing a fundraising auction. Uh, lots of times, well, most of the time, these committees are made up of volunteers. Uh, committees change often from year to year. Right. Very often there's no learnings that are passed forward to the incoming committee. We find lots of times when one committee in one particular year is at a very successful event, lots of times that event chair is very protective right. of that. You know, they get a little the competitive. Auction binder. Yeah. They get a little competitive, and sometimes that auction binder goes disappearing. It, it, go, it disappears, it isn't necessarily always passed forward. So there's lots of challenges that nonprofits face when it comes to organizing a profitable and successful event. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. And when we ask ourselves, you know, why go to the trouble of organizing a fundraising auction? Well, I think if you surveyed, all of the nonprofits out there, the overwhelming response would be our organization needs the money. Our cause needs the money. That's why we're doing it. But interestingly, the National Auctioneers Association did a study a number of years ago and found the number one reason why people choose to buy a ticket and come attend your fundraising auction event is not to support your cause. That is on their list of responses, but the number one response, in fact, 93% of respondents replied that the number one reason we go to a fundraising auction is to have a bet. Okay. Yeah, have fun. Have fun. Have an event, too. Have fun. <laughs> how am I doing? Anyway, right, yeah. <laughs> to have, have fun. So how do we bridge that gap? You know, on the one side of the fence, we've got the nonprofit uh, organization out there wanting to make money. On the other hand, we're trying to sell our tickets to people who come up primarily to have fun. Well, we bridge that gap with what I call 
the three E's of a successful fundraising auction event. And those three E's are entertain, engage, and extract. These people are making a huge commitment when they buy a ticket to come out to your fundraising auction event. Not just the price of the ticket, but more importantly, it's the gift of their time. Mm -hmm. And particularly if your auction event is being held on a weekend, the weekends never come fast enough. They never last long enough. And to ask somebody to give up a Friday or a Saturday night, you owe it, I believe, to those guests to give them an event that is going to entertain them. Mm -hmm. You definitely need to keep the crowd engaged. And when I talk about engagement, I always like to say that the focus throughout the event needs to remain on the fundraising. And how do we keep the focus on fundraising? By keeping that audience engaged. And we're going to go over all kinds of ways to do that. And finally, the big one is the extraction. How do we make the money? And let's look at this question right now. Where should the money come from? And the quick response from most nonprofits, well, most of our money is going to come from live auction and silent auction. But in fact, there are all kinds of income streams that a nonprofit should incorporate into their event. And I want to use the analogy. Well, first of all, we always advise all of our clients, the number one piece of advice that I can give you is to stop thinking like a charity and start thinking like a business. Absolutely. So once again, stop thinking like a charity, start thinking like a business. And when you think about it, Ian, organizing or having a fundraising auction is very much like opening a store that is going to be open for about five hours, and then you're going to close that store again for another year. Mm -hmm. So it's critical that during that five-hour period that the focus stays on the fundraising, that we make as much money as we can during that five-hour period, that we extract as much money as we possibly can from the guests in that room, and do it while they're having fun giving it. Absolutely. So there's all kinds of different income streams. And you think about the airline industry nowadays. I fly every week. And I look at the airlines. They charge you for baggage. They charge you to buy a little set of headphones. Uh, they charge you for food on the flight. And businesses, small to the biggest business, the smallest businesses to the largest businesses are looking at ways to add income streams. And when you look at it, there's all kinds of ways that we can add income streams to your event. And again, we'll get into some depth on these here in the webinar this morning. But yeah, it's real quick. I mean, it's important to acknowledge that the auction is such a huge part of this event, and it's it kind of, it can happen throughout the event, right? You have the silent auction that's kind of going throughout. You have the live auction that's kind of towards the main event. But it can be just the biggest revenue generator here. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the live and silent auctions typically, my experience has been, they'll account for about 50% of your revenue, and there should be an entire other 50% that you can go out and generate pre-event, during the event, and post-event. So I've taken and studied all of these different income streams, and in my book I've categorized them into two main sections, and I use an acronym here, ARC and STUDS. And ARC stands for your auctions, and when I say auctions, there are many additional auctions beside your silent and live auction. When we talk live auctions, there's all kinds of live auctions. There's uh, your uh, legacy auctions, there's wild card auctions, there's uh, seal bid auctions. Seal bid auctions. Yeah. Uh, then you've got your silent auctions. You've got silent auctions, super silent auctions. So there's all kinds of different auctions. Uh, raffles are another great way of producing income. Now, in many states, uh, you're not allowed to have raffles, but you'll have to check in your local jurisdiction. Uh, you definitely want to incorporate raffles as an income stream. And finally, one of the biggest trends that we're seeing out there today in the nonprofit sector and particularly at the fundraising auction events is the cash appeals. Now a lot of people know this as fund a need or fund an item or fund a cause, but cash appeals very, very powerful and very appealing to a lot of people. When you look at this side, we look at the art column, uh, these are the areas where you should generate the profit for your event. Over on the stud side, the stud side, did I stud side? <laughs> we, these, are the income producers that should pay your expenses. We all know what a sponsor is. That's uh, an individual or a company that donates a lump sum of cash to be used at the uh, organization's discretion for paying expenses. Uh, those sponsors are typically recognized at different levels of giving, perhaps gold, silent, or bronze. Uh, ticket sales are exactly what you would expect, and I always say to our clients that your ticket sales at the very least should cover the expense of your venue rental 
and your meals. So you never want to underestimate the importance of uh, pricing your tickets accordingly. So as if they're covering at least those expenses, depending on how popular and successful and reputable your event is, you can sometimes charge premium ticket prices. You know, uh, underwriters. This is interesting. Lots of people don't know what an underwriter is and how valuable an underwriter is. But an underwriter again is a an individual or a business who underwrites or pays the cost of a specific item at your auction event. And a perfect example would be finding a philanthropist, uh, one of your supporters, to pay for the cost of bringing in a professional fundraising auctioneer, uh, finding a philanthropist to underwrite the cost of perhaps one of your Windspire packages. Absolutely. Yeah. And the Windspire packages, as most people tuned in probably know, uh, these are no risk travel experiences that are uh, uh, that you place out there on a consignment basis so they do come at a cost to the organization but uh, only if the item sells and you can factor in your profit margins we'll talk about that a little later as well uh, finally donors these are people who make a donation of cash so you can use that money to go out and buy items for your silent or live auction and uh, or people that actually donate an auction item so that's how we differentiate and again ARC, that's where your profit comes from. On the stud side, that's where your expenses should be covered off. So let's get into the 10 deadly, 10 deadly sins of charity auctions. I show a picture of an airplane cockpit on the top right there. And I'm a private pilot. I've been flying for many years. And uh, I remember my flight instructor told me uh, many, many times that there's never one thing alone that causes an airplane to crash. And whenever they do these accident investigations, there's always a long list of things that happened to cause that plane to crash. And it's a great analogy for fundraising auctions. I have been involved with some that have been enormous successes, and I've been with some that have been not so successful. And when we look at the ones that haven't been successful, it's typically because they're committing one or more of the 10 deadly sins and here are the ones we'd like to touch on today. Unacceptable production. Uh, we're going to talk about staging, sound, lights. If uh, the people in attendance can't hear your auctioneer, you're dead in the water. You lose control of the audience, and uh, you've got a real wreck. Wrong timing of the live auction. When should we have the live auction? Uh, should be early in the evening, late in the evening. I've got some clear answers there for you. Putting the wrong items in the live auction. Mismatching or not reading your crowd rate. Uh, that's a real serious one. How do we sequence the live auction? It makes a big difference how you uh, order or the order in which you present your live auction items. Having too many items in the live auction can be a real problem as well. No matter how qualified, entertaining, engaging your auctioneer is, at some point if you have too many items in the live auction, people are just going to tune the auctioneer out, start the table chatter, and again, you run the risk of losing control of the room. We'll talk today about uh, using an unqualified auctioneer. Sometimes your media personality or an auctioneer who doesn't specialize in the fundraising auction space can end up being a real cost to you and not only cost you a lot of money but uh, uh, really uh, you, your results can really suffer. Missing revenue opportunities, again the analogy of the store for the time that we're open and the event is running, you want a lot of hooks in the water, uh, you want to, and I say hooks in the water, you want to provide a lot of opportunities for people to be investing in the evening, uh, whether it's raffle, silent, super silent, we'll touch some of that stuff. Silent auction boo-boos. Uh, the silent auction can be a great money maker for you. Lots of times we see the silent auctions underperforming because of some very common mistakes. We'll cover those. Uh, a poorly planned agenda. I said earlier in the webinar this morning, Ian, that the focus throughout the time that the event is underway needs to remain on fundraising. So committing any of these nine deadly sins brings us to the worst deadly sin and that is number 10 and that is failing to achieve your potential and that for me is the real heartbreaker to see how hard these volunteers work how many hours they put in then comes to event night and a lot of money that walked into the room walks out so let's get started right now we'll talk about unacceptable production you've been to some events where the production has been less than than acceptable absolutely and hard to hear hard to see you betcha. So when we talk about production, we're talking, let's talk sound. I think that is the single most important thing. And I would say this, that 95% of the time, maybe 99% of the time, the speakers built into the ceiling of the hotel ballroom are inadequate for a fundraising auction. They're designed for an attentive audience that is sitting there listening to somebody up on a stage giving a speech. 
and at a fundraising auction event, you have anything but an attentive audience. You have people milling around, lots of times they're drinking alcohol, that maybe there's a meal, there's a dinner, they're up and down, silent auction, and the hotel ballroom sound system is, is seldom satisfactory. What we highly recommend is that you use powered speakers, and this is what a powered speaker looks like. They should be placed around the room, surrounding the audience. More important than that even is to have an audio technician uh, that is operating the sound. And I've seen it happen before where it's during the daytime, volunteers are in setting up the room, somebody from the hotel staff gets up on stage and says, check one, two, one, two, how does that sound? The volunteers out there setting up the tables and placing the centerpieces go, oh, that's great, I can hear you, just fine, it's good. Now, it's event time, doors are open, you have 300, 400, 500 people in that ballroom, the audio dynamics have completely shifted, and what may have sounded fine at 2 o'clock in the afternoon is going to sound like this at 5 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, at 7 o'clock. And if the people can't hear the auctioneer clearly, um, again, your event is going to crash and, and burn. So you want to have an audio technician. It's, always, it's never a cost. It's always an investment to spend a few dollars, call an AV company and make sure you've got the proper equipment. And in here we show the PowerPoint presentation on the computer. Also, don't forget the music. You know, mm -hmm. create that atmosphere. Make sure you've got bouncy, upbeat music when people are coming into the room during the cocktail reception. Make sure you have some nice background music during the dinner. Music can really uh, add to it. The next deadly sin is the wrong timing of the live auction. And this is a great question. People say, when should we have our live auction? I can tell you this. I can tell you when not to have your live auction. It's, you don't want to have it late in the evening. Suppose you've opened the doors to your event at 5.30 for cocktails. They've had cocktails till 6.30. Now they're sitting for dinner at 7 o'clock. There's wine on the table. They're having more drinks. They're having a big meal. They're having dessert. Now you give them time to go up to the silent auction and refresh their drinks. And you're trying to bring everybody back. Get them seated and get their attention and focus again and get the live auction kicked off at 9.30 at night. I think that's a real disaster. I think this is the best time and I've proven this to many, many of our clients. This is the best time to have to conduct your live auction, and it's during dinner. And here's why. If you look at this crowd, you can see there's little commotion in the room. The service staff is out of the way. Everybody's seated. Uh, seated. Uh, they're eating. They have food in their mouths. There's less table chatter going on. It's very, very easy for the auctioneer at this point to step up on that stage, grab and hold everybody's attention and I've proven it time and again that this you'll make more money having your live auction during dinner. I did one event for the Autism Society a couple of years ago. We had 12 auction items in. We did six of them during dinner and generated $78,000. Wow. We did the other six items at about 9.30 at night. People had had time to finish their dinner, look at the silent auction, come back. On the last six items, which were comparable items to the first six, we did $24,000. Wow. So again, I've proven it time and again, I think the best time to um, have your live auction is, is during dinner. So give that some consideration if you've never done that. The next deadly sin is having the wrong items in your live auction. My son is a, a great fisherman. Uh, he guides in the summertime, uh, goes up near Alaska there and guides. And he and I were out fishing here uh, last summer. We've been fishing all morning long in, and we've been using live bait. And we did not have a single bite. And after a few hours of trolling around, Travis suggested that we use a, a different lure. So he pulled that, that blue plug out of his tackle box, and he put that on, and we threw it in the water. And two minutes later, this fish bit. That's a big fish. Well, that is a big fish. And I guess the point I'm trying to illustrate with this little story is you've got to have, well, first of all, sometimes if you want to catch the big fish, you've got to have a big hook. Right. And we'll talk about this later when we talk about some of the great packages that Windspire have. But you've got to be able to change it up. And I go to an awful lot of events. We have some clients now who I've served for over 20 years. And I show up at the event and they've got the same 10 auction items that they had last year. They've got the autographed hockey jersey, they've got the dinner at the president's house, the same things. You've got to change it up and mix it up. And you've got to have a lot of different hooks that you can throw in the water for your live auction. And, and so this is a real conundrum for a lot of event planners. What are the right items for our crowd? Well, to help you along with that, at the end of today's webinar, 
Yeah, we have, um, as I mentioned, we have the 400 plus auction items, uh, ideas rather, that we're going to be sending your guys' way. It's a great resource for uh, for brainstorming during that procurement party, absolutely. I, I must say, is that a Photoshop fish? Because that is gigantic. That is not <laughs> Photoshop. No, that's a big uh, king salmon, big uh, Chinook salmon. So, oh, yeah, indeed. yeah, we've caught lots of those. Uh, here's one thing that always works well at an auction, and that is wine. Uh, you'll have to check in your local jurisdiction to see if it's legal for you to sell wine. In some states, you're not uh, allowed to sell wine uh, uh, in a silent or live auction, but uh, I think in most places you can. Time and again, we, people, uh, we see people pay crazy prices for wine, uh, highly subjective in value. Look at this particular example, a silent auction I did a while ago. The value is clearly stated on that silent auction sheet at 300 and you can see the closing bid is at $800. So, so wine is usually a very, very good thing to offer in your silent or live auction. Another great way to present wine is with what we call a wine tree. And this is a structure. It's made out of plywood, and you can see it, it has a number of tiers on it. This particular one is designed to hold 100 bottles of wine. And I've sold these wine trees many times at, in their entirety, so selling all 100 bottles. I've sold them uh, per tier mm -hmm. with uh, progressively more valuable wines as you go higher on the tree with maybe a nice bottle of Dom Perignon Champagne on the top or something. But we, I've sold these wine trees uh, for anywhere from $1,500 on up to $27,000. Wow. was the most I ever got for a wine tree. So uh, plans for the wine tree are in my book, Easy Money, and you can construct your own. Deadly Sin number four. And again, we're going really quick through. Yeah, we, we, I wish we could dive through. Well, I just wish we could really, <laughs> yeah, really unpack all of this stuff and uh, really delve into it. But we're just kind of touching on, on, on some of this for you. And we hope that, uh, that you do get some good takeaways here. Uh, wrong sequencing of the live auction. Does it make a difference what order you place your live auction items in? Absolutely. And the simplest way and the most effective way to lay out your live auction is to draw a bell curve. Let's start over on the left side in what we call our tangible zone. And you see icebreaker there. Now an icebreaker item is an auction item that I personally like to use to get the crowd's attention, to give them a little taste of what they can expect later on in the evening once the full-blown auction gets underway. I like to do the icebreaker item as soon as the crowd has been seated, even before we do the speeches or anything else on that agenda. Uh, I like to get to the microphone and say, folks, Later this evening, we're going to be having a live auction. I know that a lot of you people here tonight perhaps have never been to a live auction. We don't want you to feel intimidated or uh, embarrassed or confused. We want to make it easy for you to put your hands up and bid on these great items. So we're going to start here with a, our a little icebreaker auction for you. And we have a flat screen TV. Flat screen TVs work perfect for this, Ian, I'll tell you. Go find one of your donors to donate a $300 flat screen TV, and here's what I like to do with it. I'll say, all right, here's our first item, flat screen TV. Let's start this at $10,000. Who'd go $10,000? Well, I know nobody's going to put a hand up, and I do this intentionally. All right, let's go $10,000, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, you should see the faces of the people in that audience. Their jaws drop, and people are going, what? I'm going, yep, that, there you go, folks. That's how it works. Live auction, if you want to buy something here tonight, you got to get in on the action and get your hand up. And our first bidder just got a nice flat screen TV for $20. Well, you may be sitting there wondering, well, what's the donor going to think about that? Well, you know what? Explain that to the donor early on that their donation of the flat screen is going to be used for that purpose. And here's why I do that, to entertain the crowd. More importantly, when I come back to resume the rest of the live auction, do you think I have everybody's attention once I start? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you'll more than recover that $250 that you didn't make or whatever on that TV in the rest of the auction. So as we move along the bell curve, we're going to deal with the fun items here. In our tangible zone, these are things ideally that are physically present at the auction. Perhaps you have a set of golf clubs and a local golf club membership, so you hold the clubs up. Maybe you have an autographed guitar. Uh, autographed by a star and some tickets to an upcoming concert. Maybe you have a barbecue package. You've got the barbecue on stage and, and a couple of lawn chairs and that. So stuff people can actually see. These are fun items and these are items that are easy to get the crowd engaged. Mm -hmm. so we talked about the engagement. Um, 
dinners. I like to deal with those sooner than later. Uh, regardless when you start your live auction, if people are a little bit hungry, and if we're starting the live auction during dinner while they're eating, they're definitely, they have an appetite. They're, they're going to pay a lot more money for those restaurant packages, or if it's a rotary auction and the rotary president has donated a, a dinner for six at his or her home or a barbecue, they're going to pay a lot more money for those dinners early in the auction than later on. We look at the top of the bell curve and we see that's where we're going to place our highest priced item. And for an example here this morning, let's suppose that we have an African safari package that maybe is valued at, let's say, $20,000. Where do we want to place that? Well, if you were to ask most nonprofit uh, auction organizers, I think the typical response would be your most expensive item. Be towards the end of the day. Towards the end of the day. That's right. They say, let's say the expensive one for the last. That's a big no-no. And you want to have your most expensive item at the top of the bell curve, and here's why. You're going to have a few people competing and bidding on that African safari, but only one person is going to be lucky enough to win that package, to buy that package. So suppose you've had two or three other bidders who were maybe dumped off at eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000. You've sold it to the high bidder for 20000 where did those other bidders go who were willing a moment ago to spend the eighteen or nineteen thousand dollars with you? They have no place to go if that safari was at the very end of the auction. Right. But now what we want to do is we want to have other premium items that we go that that that, that we sell next. And this is where the Windspire uh, travel packages come in too. And maybe talk for a second about some of the great great items that you folks have. Absolutely. I mean, this is where we see a lot of our Napa packages, uh, any of our you know award show or uh, you know music uh, packages as well. This is just you know this is the point of the live auction where you want to start talking about experiences, getting people amped, and um, you know this is where Windspire is best leveraged. You betcha. We come down into that experiential zone, finally winding up the live auction with our lesser value items. So uh, that's just a quick overview of sequencing your live auction, but some important points there. Deadly sin number five is too many items in the live auction, and how many auction items is enough? My recommendation is always keep your live auction between eight and 12 items. So let's pick 10 as an average. Lots of our clients have solicited and been very successful and picked up 20, 25, 30 live auction items. So what do you do with those extras? And first of all, why do you only want 8 to 12 in your live auction? Well, because no matter how entertaining and funny your live auctioneer is, at some point people just tune out to the auctioneer's uh, chant and they stop paying attention and the amount of money you make is going to drop off the more items that you have in your auction has been my experience. So what do we do with those extra items? We peel those other items off, those other premium items that were good enough to be in the live auction, and we place them in a separate section of the silent auction that we refer to as a super silent auction. And in this picture we have a wonderful demonstration from a rotary club. They've set up a real nice area here, excellent signage, great lighting on these other premium items. Each item in there was good enough to get into the live auction, but the MC needs to explain or the auctioneer needs to explain that folks, why we've peeled some of these items off here tonight is basically to respect your time. And so we're not here until midnight with the live auction. Also the benefit to you folks is it gives you a little extra opportunity to have a little closer look at some of these wonderful donations that we've received here. And this is a good time to folks to recognize some of the donors of these wonderful packages. We want to thank the folks at Amtrak for donating that great travel package. We want to thank the people from, you know, wherever, uh, give them recognition. So that's a super silent auction. It's in a separate area of the room, uh, and again, well lit, and I'll just mention the super silent auction is, should be, the last part of your silent auction that you close. You save that for the very, very end. So, all right, uh, the next deadly sin is using an unqualified auctioneer, and Talk for a second about that one, Ian. Yeah, I mean, because I'm an auctioneer and I have to sound self-serving, <laughs> self-serving, and I don't want to sound that way. Oh, I never, Dan. You never sound like that. But I mean, the unqualified auctioneers that you'll you'll come and see, right? There's, um, you know, the various other types of auctioneer professions. Uh, but you know, commonly we'll also see you know media personalities from like a local news network, someone in your organization who loves hopping on the microphone and, and feels just like they're they're a really good MC. Uh, they aren't necessarily the best fundraisers, but commonly uh, we'll we'll also see you know nonprofits try to leverage 
um, other auctioneers from other professions. You see, you know, you, you have your art auctioneer, uh, your cattle uh, auctioneer, your automobile auctioneer, or even your heavy equipment auctioneer. These people are not the same as a benefit auctioneer because they are not um, they are not trained in the art of extracting money out of the entire audience. They That's think right. about it in a whole different way. Well, they do, and uh, I want to say that the most successful auctioneers in in any area of the auction industry are the ones who specialize. Right. And we've each got our own different tips and techniques and tools and strategies and tricks of the trade right. that we use. I would be dead in my shoes if I tried to step into any of these other auctioneers' shoes. You know, selling art and estate sales and, and antiques or selling livestock or selling automobiles. Uh, these are all highly specialized fields within the auction industry as is fundraising, auctioneering, and I like to use an analogy, if you were going to get a root canal, you needed a root canal, uh, and your neighbor was a proctologist, and because he's your friend, he was going to do it for free, would you go to him because he was offered to do it, or would you rather go and pay your dentist? Right. Well, I think the answer is, is, is pretty plain. Even though they're both doctors, both doctors, you want to go to the one that specializes. And benefit auctioneer specialists, uh, the benefit auctioneer specialist is, a, is a, uh, a designation that we have achieved through the National Auctioneers Association. And if you're looking for a qualified fundraising auctioneer, check with the National Auctioneers Association. You can Google, but we highly recommend that you find somebody who specializes in fundraising, primarily not only because we have our own unique set of skills and, and tools, but because we think differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, a regular auctioneer, say one of these art auctioneers or a cattle auctioneer, they're thinking one thing. That auctioneer on the top left picture, he's thinking, how much money can I get for this picture? The auctioneer on the top right picture is thinking, how much money can I get for this steer right now? But a benefit auctioneer is thinking, how much money is in this room tonight? And how can we extract as much of it as possible? And to extract that money, we've got all kinds of different uh, uh, techniques that we use. Let's get into some of those right now as we talk about deadly sin number seven, and that is missed revenue opportunities. One of the neatest techniques that we use is called a double up. And this is where we've sold, a, say, a dinner package to a local restaurant for $2,500, dinner for six people, includes wine with each course, sold for $2,500. This is where a fundraising auctioneer turns to the second high bidder who was on at $2,400 and says to that bidder, sir or ma'am, if we could get you an identical package to the restaurant, would you consider matching the first bidder's price at $2,500 and taking a second identical package? 90% of the time, my experience has been, if you make that offer to the second high bidder, he or she will accept that. And that is what we call a double up. And that is, and here's something really important for our listeners this morning to consider. For an example, let's take a look, and just for illustration's sake, suppose that we have 10 live auction items that sell for an average, of, let's say $5,000 a piece, just to make this illustration. You, those are your successful bidders, so you've collected 50,000. But what about those second high bidders? The bidders who dropped off, say, at $4,500 times 10. So there's $45,000 that people were holding their hands up just a moment earlier saying, I'd love to give your, 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 your organization $45,000, but they didn't because we had no way to go out and capture, capture that second high bidder. So a double up is a wonderful technique. So how would you, how would you go about uh, procuring an auction item um, to ensure that you can double up? I mean, how do you ask the, the donor? Well, uh, we always uh, suggest to our clients that when you're out procuring your live auction items that you ask each and every donor, uh, and Mr. Smith, uh, we thank you for donating the package to your restaurant. Let us ask you now uh, if we had a real lightning strike and we were able to sell this restaurant package for a really high price, would you consider donating a second identical dinner? Well, you can say one of two things, either yes or no. And if it's a yes, bang, you know that automatically you've set yourself up to double up on that item and double your profits. If he says no, then what you can do, as an auctioneer, I often use my discretion from the stage, and I know if it's dinner for four, there's no way it costs 2500 bucks. But I will just take it upon myself to offer that double up to do it, knowing that the event organizers can go and pay for that second dinner. So maybe they have to pay a thousand dollars 
for that second dinner. They still made a, a profit of 1500 bucks. Wow. So I recommend that when you're out soliciting uh, auction items, ask everybody who's donating an item, if we get lucky, get a big price, would you consider donating a second item? That's cool. And that's the thing I love as a professional fundraising auctioneer. I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, what I really love about working with Windspire and having the opportunity to sell the Windspire no-risk travel packages because part of your policy... Yep, you can sell them as many times as you want. So if you have multiple interested, interested bidders, right, and you get it, you're, you're up there and you're well above the, you know, the reserve minimum that you set um, and you have three bidders that are interested, why not sell them to all three? You know, before that third bidder drops out, uh, stop the bidding and uh, and triple the amount that you'll make on a single package. Yeah. And if you've never used a consignment package, typically how they work or how the Windspire travel packages work, you'll have what they call a non-profit price. So perhaps you're buying a, a, a vacation package. They always include, well, my experience, from what I've sold of, of the Windspire trips, they include airfare, they yeah. include great accommodation and uh, tickets to different attractions or, or whatever, maybe it's right. the Country Music Awards or, or whatever. Um, and you have what you call a non-profit price. So let's say that the event planner has taken one of your packages, the non-profit price is $2,000. You, the non-profit, get to establish what the minimum opening bid is for that package. And I know here at Windspire, you folks uh, typically recommend that the minimum opening bid is a 20% increase. Correct, 20% so, increase. Yep. So 20% as a minimum opening bid. Now, as an auctioneer, it's easy for me from the stage to say that folks, the Lakewood Rotary Club here tonight have established the minimum opening bid on this particular package at $2,400. So that's where we're going to open the bidding and let's get started. We're well below retail value. Who'd go 2400 24, 25, 25, 2600, 26. Even if it sells for just the 2400, you've made a return of 20% on your investment. Absolutely. You know, and that's why I don't understand why some people are reluctant to, to uh, put a consignment package or two into their auctions because there is no risk. You don't pay for the package un until and unless it sells. So, And here's a great idea too if you are considering uh, trying a consignment package or using consignment packages. You should not have to pay for that out of your uh, pocket if it sells or yeah, I don't think it should come out of your profits. And I'm speaking to the nonprofits here this morning. A great idea is to go out and secure an underwriter. Mm -hmm. Find a donor who will donate one of these packages. So if it comes at a cost of, suppose it's a trip to New Orleans, which would come at a non-profit price of... Yeah, 3500 bucks, let's yeah, say. 3500 so how would that work then? Well, you, you go out and you, uh, you solicit donors to maybe underwrite the cost of a travel package, and what that does, it does a couple things, right? It, it gives them an opportunity to be recognized during the live auction. You know, when which Danny, they love. Which they absolutely love. Danny will get up there and say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith donated this travel package to New, New Orleans. Uh, for our Mardi Gras theme, uh, you know, give them a round of applause. But also, once they, once Danny gets up there and sells the package, and per perhaps sells it multiple times, they're seeing their initial invested investment of thirty five hundred bucks turn into five, six, seven thousand dollars, and uh, that that is just uh, something you can't match. No, they, they absolutely love it. So consider getting uh, underwriters for as many things as you possibly can. Yeah, and not just packages, but also everything else. That right? cost your auctioneer, your centerpieces, your table wine, all the rest of it. Find underwriters. Um, here's another great, great technique that I use when it comes to selling artwork. In this particular case, we were conducting an auction for a medical... A, a, a medevac service yeah. in our community called Stars Air Ambulance and they had donated at their fundraising auction a photograph of one of the helicopters at a crash site they wanted me to auction the picture off my judgment I thought we might get 350 or 400 dollars for that picture and I thought we could do I knew we could do a lot better so I introduced one of the pilots got him onto the stage and I said captain I said you know, I've had him tell a couple of stories about some of the missions that they've been on and, and the importance of his work and how they were saving lives. And I said, Captain, what does it cost to fly the helicopter for an hour? And he said, well, the fuel alone is $1,000. So I said, well, folks, do we have anybody here tonight that might consider underwriting an hour's worth of fuel for the helicopter, for the medevac helicopter? And anybody that does will ask you to sign the back of this picture. And then we'll take all of your names and we'll have a nice plaque engraved with everybody's name on the plaque who signed the back of the picture and donated a thousand dollars and then we'll hang the picture and the plaque in the local airport a nice public location where everybody can see it and you can be recognized for your donation 17 hands go up 
17 hands. So that picture that may have sold for only $400 ended up generating 17000 So folks, this is a great technique to use, particularly when your auctioneer is selling a, a piece of live artwork. In this particular illustration, I'm doing an auction for Rotaract, which is the junior arm of the Rotary Club. And uh, we had a local artist who had painted this picture, and he was a fairly renowned artist in our area. And I started the bidding on his art piece and was stuck at $200. I was embarrassed. I felt bad. I felt horrible. I felt bad for the artist. He no doubt felt bad. So I stopped the bidding and I said, folks, you know what? I'd be the first here to donate $100 and anybody that joins me, let's sign the back of this picture and then let's hang it in the local children's hospital. Beautiful, colorful picture. All the kids can enjoy it. We'll have a plaque made up. Well, you can see the results right there went from 200 to 2200. So I call it the super signature technique and it's a great one that you can incorporate even this weekend if you have an auction and you have a piece of, uh, of artwork in there. This next item, talk about a revenue opportunity. This is an idea we came up with. I love this one. <laughs> Danny loves this one. <laughs> I, love this one. <laughs> I love this one. For years and years, Ian, I had my auctions. I was hearing people come up at the end of the auction saying, you know what? I would have donated something to the live auction, but uh, nobody asked. So I heard this over and over. Finally, at one of my auction events, it was a rotary auction again, I decided to take a package of these neon-colored index cards. I tossed a couple on each table, and I said from the stage, I said, folks, I'm going to try a thing called a wild card auction. It's made up the name. Wild card auction. If you'd like to make a donation to the live auction tonight, write down your name, your phone number, and the item you'd like to donate and send it up to the stage. The very first night that I did this was at a rotary auction and we made $46,500 wow. off the floor. $46,500 worth of donations that had not been asked for. So very powerful. I'm what, just gonna, what do you put on the cards? So you, you put you the cards on the table. Cards, just blank cards on the table. Again, if you have an auction this weekend, give this one a try. Here's a great takeaway. Throw a couple of neon colored index cards on each table. Have your auctioneer or your MC explain. It's a wild card auction, folks. And you know, interesting thing here, if you asked people, you might have asked somebody two weeks ago for a donation, and they, they, they said no. Now they're at the event, they're caught up in the excitement, they're caught up in the emotion, they're caught up in the passion, they're having fun, this wild card kicks off, they see their friends donating items, and they're inclined now to make a donation. So it's one, and a great way to identify future donors as well. So I'm going to show you a slide here of a kind of what I would call a typical wild card auction. This is one that we did recently and you can see see the items that were donated and the money that they generated. But look at the bottom one. That was the town doctor <laughs> do donated a painless vasectomy. And you know, a painless vasectomy and I thought who is going to bid on that? And and I actually took his card and I tossed it on the floor. I ignored it. He got upset. And he came up at the end of the wild card. He said, why didn't you sell my donation? And I said, Doc, I said, I thought you were joking. He said, I'm not. I said, you think somebody will pay money for that? He said, yeah, try it. Well, doggone, we sell it for $7,600. I couldn't believe it. And as soon as I said sold, I could see why we got that money. The fellow's wife jumped up, and she went, woohoo, and she was about eight months pregnant. <laughs> so anyway, at the end of that particular wild card auction, $20,600. Uh, just last Saturday night, I was doing an auction uh, again, and uh, we did the wild card, and I think we did about $36,000 in wow. the wild card. So it doesn't always work. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't always. Some nights you won't get any response uh, to it, but more often than not, it, it works lots of times. We'll pick up an extra five, eight, ten thousand dollars in the wild card, and then you get those home run nights when you'll hit fifty thousand dollars, sometimes even, even more. So it's worth a try. And again, why why wouldn't you try it? Talk about another revenue opportunity, and that's our cash appeals, which people often know as fund an item, fund a need, fund a mission. And this is very simply where we ask people to pledge money. Not an easy thing to do to stand up and, and ask people to donate money. But there are some ways that you can make it easier. And I'd like to talk quickly about the four requirements of an incredible cash appeal. You need to have an emotional trigger. So if uh, often hospital foundations are raising money for baby incubators or specialized equipment, uh, maybe it's a cancer foundation event where you've come off a very compassionate, uh, very emotional video and the crowd has been triggered emotionally. When that happens, you need to be prepared to, to do what I call the ask. 
not easy to ask for money, so you want to be prepared for this. You're, and this, again, fundraising auctioneers, professional fundraising auctioneers are trained in how to conduct these and do them properly. Uh, you need to have bid card numbers. Always have bid card numbers at your auctions. There's no excuse not to have them. And finally, you want three people to record the bid card numbers as the auctioneer starts to call out these numbers as people raise their hands. I did an event here last year for a suicide prevention event in a small community. Uh, a family had uh, lost a uh, mother to suicide, and her 12-year-old son came onto the stage and delivered a wonderful speech. And towards the end of his speech, he thanked the audience of 600 people, and he said, I especially want to thank the hospice and the people we have here tonight from the local hospice. I don't know what my brother and I would have done this past year unless we had been in the hospice child grief program. He said they really did help us. He said, I wish every child who's lost a parent to suicide could go to this program, but they can't because it costs a thousand dollars to send a kid to the hospice for the for the year grief program. Then he started to cry. And he turned and he walked away from the podium. And there was not a dry eye in, in that hall of six hundred people. So I stepped up to the stage and I said, you know what, I would be happy to sponsor a child to go through that program. And I said, I'll be the first to pledge a thousand dollars. I said, is there anybody here that would join me? We had 56 people wow. raise their bid card numbers in the air. And we had $57,000 in just a few moments. So again, cash appeals can be very, very effective. Emotional trigger sounds like. Emotional, the, emotional yeah. trigger is, is the key. Some other considerations uh, with your cash appeal, timing is crucial. Uh, it, it, they're hard to plan for. You know, even if you're planning to have a cash appeal, it's hard to say that we're going to do it at 7.15 or do it at 9.20. Sometimes it needs to be a little loose and you just have to wait until you've got that emotional point in the evening. But uh, And whenever you hit that emotional trigger, that's when you launch into it. So timing is crucial. Uh, check with your local tax authorities, but if you're a registered nonprofit, you can often issue a charitable tax receipt for these cash pledges and that sometimes will influence people to give a little bit more generously. And finally, priming the pump is a good idea. If you're planning to have a cash appeal during your event or a fund an I uh, a need or fund an item, uh, talk to some of your supporters at the event early in the evening or even prior to the event and say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we know you're great supporters of our hospital foundation. We're going to raise money tonight to cash appeal for baby incubators. Can we count on you to uh, make a pledge? And if so, in what amount? And if you can get that commitment in advance and the auctioneer knows that as soon as he makes the ask, he or she makes the ask, they know that hands are going to go up right away, that just gets everything going. Momentum. Uh, momentum. That's exactly what it primed the pump. Uh, share a very quick story. I was doing an auction for Brightview School and the local Rotary Club had created a, I keep talking about Rotary, it's, it's an, I, I do a lot of work with the Rotary Clubs and, and some of the greatest ideas that I've seen come from the, the Rotarians, but um, in this particular case, we had uh, this Brightview school, they have a hot lunch program, and the Rotarians had, had created this program because lots of the kids at this school were coming in the mornings on empty tummies and no lunches. So we came up with an idea to have a class of 30 of the kids paint lunch uh, boxes. And I had assured the Rotary Club and Brightview School that we would be able to auction these for about $100 a piece, I figured. I didn't think that would be much of a stretch. We had the school principal come up and give a very impassioned uh, speech presentation again not a dry eye in the house the 30 kids came in they held up their lunch boxes and just before I started to auction these I had the idea you know where it came from I, I just said folks just before we start the live auction we only have 30 lunch boxes is there anybody here would consider pledging a thousand dollars to have first choice of lunch box we had eight hands go up eight hands so I said wow anybody else want to take a lunch box at a thousand dollars we had 26 people in wow. come forward and take a lunchbox, but that left us with four little kids at the end of it all, standing there holding their lunchboxes in the air, and one of the little girls started to cry. And she was just sobbing because nobody took her lunchbox. So I said, wow, what are the chances 
that the four best lunch boxes, the four prettiest lunch boxes, are left to the end here. I said, this is unbelievable that it would happen this way. And one woman came forward from the crowd and she picked up the last four boxes with a $4,000 donation. So the big winner was the Right View School and the Rotary Club took about 10 minutes to get $30,000. So that's just another form of cash appeal. It's all about that emotional trigger. Yeah. Lots of different ways of doing these cash appeals and uh, we'll provide resources at the end here where you can get some more you know, great ideas. We're going to talk silent auction boo-boos. One of the biggest boo-boos is closing your silent auction during the live auction. That is a no-no. should never happen. Your live auctioneer uh, wants to have the complete undivided attention and focus of the attendees in the room. Uh, he or she is trying to move that crowd all in, in one direction and build momentum in this auction. And the worst thing can happen is to have an event volunteer come up, interrupt the auctioneer and say, would you please announce that the Green Silent Auction is going to close in two minutes. I hate doing that because then a third of my crowd get up and they run off and it really disrupts your live auction. All kinds of silent auction boo-boos um, placing values on your bid sheets should you state the value of the item. Not always. Lots of times placing your value there can create a glass ceiling and it, it can stifle the bidding. People come to an auction, especially a silent auction, they like to think they're getting a deal. So if it's if it's a highly subjective item you're selling, like a piece of artwork that is very valuable, then I would state the price to give people that reference point. A wine. If it's a basket of wine that is yeah. particularly valuable, I would state the value then so they know it's good quality and expensive wine. But otherwise, I, I, we often recommend that you don't state the values on the silent auction sheets and, and the same applies to uh, in the live auction. Little boo-boos, uh, probably half a dozen times a year, I see it happen where the ballroom door is open, the crowd comes flooding in, and now some volunteer is running around screaming, where are the pens? Where are the pens? You know, the volunteer responsible for putting pens out with each of the silent auction sheets forgot to do his or her job. So those are uh, little bit of um, Putting cheap items in your silent auction, the embroidered ball caps and the logoed coffee mugs and stuff, I, you know, I just think that takes away from, from everything. And, and uh, so anyway, long list of boobers. We don't have time to get into a bunch of them, but again, the resources are coming up here at the end for you. I want to talk about deadly sin number nine, and that is a poorly planned agenda. There are many, many elements that can compose your evening. And the, often we have speeches, we have videos, we have grace, we have the national anthem. Sometimes we have awards presentations. Sometimes we brought in a special entertainer. I was interrupted. My auction was shut down last year at one event for 30 minutes so we could watch the event chairs grade four granddaughter tap dance for a half hour. Oh, it was like a root canal without freezing. <laughs> yeah, I don't care how much you love tap dancing, uh, half an hour tap dancing from the best grade four tap dancer is just more than any person should have to endure. And in fact, the crowd within minutes was out of control and we never did completely regain control of that audience. So it cost that organization a lot of money. You want to keep the focus on the fundraising. So uh, the poorly planned agenda is a very important one um, and there's lots of places here at Winspire to get resources uh, to help guide you to creating an agenda that is going to keep the focus on the fundraising. Yeah, you know, there's other things like uh, that I know nonprofits like to do, spend time, you know, handing out awards, recognitions. Those are important, but they are not generating revenue. There's ways to uh, recognize people and do it in a fundraising capacity. Um, you know, and it's just really important, as Danny has stated, right, to keep that focus really intently um, spent on that, that short amount of time um, where you have your one night only storefront is spent right on fundraising. You bet. All right, and the tenth deadly sin is the worst of all, and that is failing to achieve your potential. You've invested a lot of time energy and resources in uh, getting your tickets sold, getting your auction items assembled, and, and by committing any of the nine previous deadly sins, they can cause your event to fail in achieving its potential, and that is the greatest sin of all. So we encourage you to uh, uh, do the research, do the homework. There's lots of great resources available and uh, to prevent these 10 deadly sins, and again, we've gone through them. We show them to you very quickly. Um, if you want to like some additional information or if uh, you'd like to contact uh, me, uh, we do have a website at dannyhooper.com as well. We invite you to uh, order a copy of the book. We guarantee you won't be disappointed. It's, uh, it's an easy read. I like to think of it as Fifty Shades of Grey for fundraisers. <laughs> My book. Very compelling read. Very compelling. Compelling read. <laughs> and of course, a great, great resource 
uh, for everybody is right here at uh, Winspire. Yes, uh, as always, we uh, are always open to giving you guys some free event consultations, uh, not only to learn how to use Nowhere's Travel in your next fundraiser, but just you know, imp implementing a lot of the ideas that we've shared here um, and in Danny's book. Um, our fundraising specialists are infinitely knowledgeable um, uh, to helping you really achieve that, that successful event. So uh, you can reach us at any time there. And then also, um, as we mentioned before, coming soon we have a checklist builder, uh, which is going to be an incredible tool that we're excited to announce. Um, probably in time for the next um, the next webinar that we'll be holding. It's uh, got all this information that Danny put in his book um, here in this webinar, and then also from Winspire News and all of our resources uh, thrown right in there. It's just going to be a great tool for you event planners. Yeah, this tool is a web-based app, works on any device, and we think it's going to be a real game changer for uh, for the way that fundraising auction events are organized, and uh, it keeps all these details keeps it keeps things from falling through the cracks. Absolutely. Never again will you show up and not have pens for your silent auction. It clearly instructs the volunteers what everybody's tasks are, holds them accountable. It's a very, very powerful and neat tool. We're really excited about it. Absolutely. So stay tuned for that. Again, uh, we have another webinar coming up in about a month on June twenty second. Uh, same time. Uh, that's a Wednesday, and it's gonna we're gonna be diving a little bit further into how to generate record profits. I'm um, going a little bit more in depth on some of these topics, so I'll be sending out a, a link to register for that. Again, another free webinar. And uh, we want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank you guys, um, give you guys um, access to this resource here. Uh, just a list of uh, 400 amazing auction item ideas that you can download just directly by going to this link, u.winspireme.com backslash 400. And with that, we want to, to actually open it up for any questions that you guys might have. Um, I know that uh, we're going to kind of go through some of these, open it up for a Q&A. So does the day and time of event have an impact on its success? Um, Saturday brunch versus Saturday dinner. Oh, good question. That's a great question. Um, I think I've probably conducted fundraising auctions at all times of the day and uh, no two are the same. I would say that. Does it have an impact? I would say depends on the nature of your event and if you're able to get people out for a Saturday afternoon brunch you know and that's I don't I haven't seen that happen a lot I've done a couple during the daytime but if it will work in your marketplace uh, give it a try you know what the heck you'll know soon enough it's working no reason why it shouldn't work so you haven't seen much of an impact on timing uh, I don't think so it depends on what the cause is for what the charity is and, and if yeah if you can get people out you know at any time of the day or night for an event it, it should work Got another question here. What timing would you recommend for an auction that doesn't serve a plated meal, only a buffet, especially when there aren't enough seats for all guests? Okay, good question. Uh, one of the th I love it when there's a buffet being served at a fundraising auction event because one of the one of the surefire live auction items is I always like to auction off the chance to be the first person to the buffet line, <laughs> and with that I say whoever buys this chance to be the first person to the buffet line, we're going to let you pick in the room who goes last oh, wow. to the buffet. And I say the reason you might want to bid on this item is because we've sold 250 tickets to the event here this evening, but we only have enough food for 220 people. So I'll say that as a joke. So I'll say, all right, let's get going. You can generate a few thousand extra dollars doing this. Wow. You know, at the, at the right event, I've had uh, events where people. And I was doing one event, and, and this was back before the oil market crashed. But uh, one fellow paid eight thousand dollars to be the first one to dinner. It was for a, a hospital event in their town, so they're obviously out to support a great cause. And what I did, I said, okay, sir, who would you like to pick to go last to dinner? So he picked one of his competitors in the room. And then I went to the first bidder. I said, well, sir, you know, I said, let me ask you this. If that competitor that you just pointed to, if he would agree to match your bid at $8,000, would you be good enough to let him go second to the buffet? <laughs> and 99% of the time, the first bidder will say, well, absolutely, 99% of the time, we will get that second Second from the guy, yeah, that's great, and so able to uh, double up that way. So, um, yeah. yeah, so the question, uh, what timing would you recommend for an auction? Uh, does this, yeah, you can go, yeah, I would think at buffet once they've gone through the buffet and everybody has their, has their meal, unless it's something where they're going all through the night, then you just have to start the auction whenever you can slide it in. Right. But if it's a uh, 
if everybody's going to the buffet at the same time, they're going to have their meals at the same time. Once they've all been through the buffet, there's nobody else in the lineup, even though some people are standing. I would go ahead and start the live auction. Here's another little tip. If your room is set up this way and there aren't enough seats for everybody, um, I would recommend that you can send some chairs to set up right in front of the stage. Maybe set 20 chairs or 30 chairs right in front of the stage and the MC can announce these are for people who would like to participate in the live auction mm -hmm. that we're going to get started here at, mm -hmm. at whatever time. So That's good. I hope that helped. That question was from Elizabeth Potter. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we got another one from Deborah Boyer. Um, what if you're not having a sit-down dinner with just cocktails and buffet stations? How do you get people's attention if there's no seating? Kind of a similar question. Yeah, so there we go. Bring in some seats and put them. I had an event like that two weeks ago up in Victoria. Uh, let's see. From Christy Clark, what if you're serving heavy um, hors d'oeuvres and no dinner? Similar thing. Uh, maybe people milling around. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, again, that's where it's really important to make sure that you have somebody up on the stage that's a little bit dynamic. And again, there's lots of good professionals. Check with the National Auctioneers Association or, or give us a call. Make sure you've got somebody out there that's got a little bit dynamic and, and has some experience in controlling a crowd and getting their attention. Great, we got another question here from uh, Imani Berg, actually one of our donation giveaway winners. Hey Imani, how you doing? Um, so we got a quick question about uh, item number two regarding auction timing. Many of our gala committee members in the past have been worried about, are worried that bidders, particularly women, want to be left alone during dinner and would have a strongly negative reaction to running the auction during dinner. How would you respond? Uh, what do you think about having the auction at the end of dinner uh, but before dancing, which is what we've typically done at our annual ball? Uh, I would say as long as it's not getting too late and again respect the physiology of people and take a hard look when did you start serving them cocktails were you giving wine at dinner how long was dinner how how many courses did you have and even for the largest galas we recommend keep it to three courses five course dinners create too much commotion in the room from the service staff setting tables clearing tables makes it very difficult to get the crowd's attention and we always tell our clients that people don't go to a fundraising gala to have a romantic dinner, mm -hmm. a romantic night out. They're not there for the fine dining most of the time. You know, they're there to have fun and you can present, and I've done the, the biggest of the big gallons and seen them do very, very successful meals that are only three courses long and just keeps things a little better organized. I don't think I answered that question. No, I think, yeah, I mean, it sounds like the best time to do it is during dinner. I mean, that's the one that you've... That's, that's what I like, and uh, I don't know. I have not seen women protest to having the dinner, the, the auction during dinner. So, yeah. yeah, and it's kind of interesting, too, in my experience, and I've done, I don't know, thousands of live auctions and stuff. I would say that... Uh, 75 80 percent of the time it's the men do the bidding yeah yeah I don't know don't know why that is but women you should be uh, raising your hands up more Get yeah I think, you know there. I think maybe it has to do with sometimes the ladies at the dinner they, they come for a nice night out and they want to visit uh, people suppose, at the yeah. table and I get that and so you don't start the live auction as soon as people sit down uh, let them have that first course uh, I see. Yeah. then bring the entree and I once the entree has been set at the tables and people are uh, into their dinner a little bit, then you can start it. You know, maybe when they're halfway through their meal, you can start the live auction. What about, uh, we've got another question here from Casey Gravitt. Uh, can you have too few live auctions? We usually have two to three items. Um, I suppose it depends on the items, but... Uh, no, you, you know, too few. I mean, you're not going to bring in a professional fundraising auctioneer for two or three items. Uh, and if you do, then make sure that you incorporate a wild card auction. Try and get some more items. So why wouldn't you have more than less. Why would you go to all the work of organizing an event, selling tickets to your event, getting the crowd in there, getting all that money in the room, and not offering them the chance to bid on more than two or three live auction items? It takes no more work to go out and solicit two or three live auction items than to get 10 or 12 good yeah. live auction items. It, re it really doesn't. Just I mean, yeah. get more people on your team and delegate, get more people out doing auction acquisitions, throw in some wins by our packages. It's easy to bulk up. And, and make your live auction more robust. Here's a good question from uh, Terry Morgan. How much should one pay for a qualified auctioneer? Well, that's a good question. We can't discuss uh, fees. I can tell you that uh, uh, different professional auctioneers will charge based on their reputation and their track record is probably a fair way to say it. I know that there's some auctioneers out there charge a fee. 
Uh, there's some that work strictly on commission, and there's some that work on a combination, combination on a flat fee and commission. So it's always negotiable, and uh, don't be afraid to negotiate and uh, to check around, check different people's. You're, but you're not just shopping for the fees for the lowest fee, right. because obviously it's like in any business, your low cost supplier is not always your best. Right. You know, so look closer at the person's reputation and their track record. And it has to do again with thinking like a business, stop thinking like a charity. And if you have one auctioneer that you're going to spend a dollar and make a dollar ten with that auctioneer, but there's another one, if you spend a dollar you're going to make a dollar and a half, you decide then, you know, which one you're going to invest. Another question from Julia Carnes. Uh, so with the wild card, how do you auction them off without adding a, a whole hour to your auction? How do you get that done quickly? Well, that's a good, very good question. We don't always accept all of the wild cards that come forward. Uh, we will uh, go through them, and the ones that are like a haircut, uh, somebody donates a haircut or a hairstyle, sometimes, you know, if I have a, a fishing trip on some guy's private mm -hmm. fishing boat and a haircut, I'll go for the better, the more valuable of the two items. So it just it, it, who's, it, who is the person that and this is a question from Tara? Uh, who is the person who is um, reviewing those and uh, and picking them up? And auctioneer. then the auctioneer is actually going around auctioneer. picking up the cards and looking at them and saying yes, no, yes, no, yes. No. Yes, I have the cards brought up to the stage. So I tell the people, please bring the cards up to the stage here. And it's fun to stand yeah. on stage yeah. and see people see those neon colored cards yeah. coming up to the stage. It's always exciting to see. And I explain to people, I thank them always. And when the first wild card comes up, I'll stop everything. I'll say, folks, we've just had our first wild card donation tonight. And uh, Jim and uh, his wife, Teresa, have donated their, uh, their football tickets to see the game coming up next Sunday. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Wow, these are great seats. Give them the recognition, and that gets other people spurred. They're going, oh, wow. A little recognition, you know, nice. gets them spurred to. So that's just a little, little technique. How long does it usually take? Can you get it done in about half an hour? Or oh, it's it... just you can, maybe it takes two minutes oh, to, to sell a wild card item. I don't waste a lot of. And you're doing time. it throughout the, throughout the live auction. You can do it throughout the live auction. Okay. You can mix it. You can do it as a, a standalone. You can say after the regular live auction, we'll deal with our wild cards. Um, yeah, it's a discretionary thing. Your auctioneer will have experience with uh, how to fit those in. But and then does the auctioneer set the price? Or does the donor put the value? And how does the Sometimes the donor will put the value, but there is no reserve bid. Right. There's no minimum price on the wild cards. Right. So lots of times they'll put the value. So if somebody has a vacation pro property down in Capo San Lucas, they'll say it's a, a lovely private home. It rents for $5,000 a week. That information is helpful to the live auctioneer. So. So yeah, I mean, we're getting a lot of quite a few questions about the wild card auction, about how long it should last. Um, you know, how many items do you usually do you cap it at a certain number of items? Or uh, if I have the crowd's attention, doing a good job entertaining, everybody is engaged, uh, and I get say ten or twelve wild card auctions, and the money is good, and we've got everybody laughing, and as, as I say it again, they're engaged. Uh, I'll just rattle through those really quick and, and do as many as I can after we've peeled off the ones that have minimal value. Right. Right. And, and you know what, to be honest, some nights you'll get no wild cards. It yeah. doesn't always work, but right. it's, it's worth a try. Yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of the, the spirit here, you know. A lot of these things are worth a try, but you can, you know, you can get out of it quickly because uh, all you have is just cards on the table at the yeah. end of the day. Um, interesting question here from Kevin. Um, uh, I don't know how to say Haraz. Um, for or against using cell phone mobile bidding system to submit donations during the or even bidding during the, bidding in the live auction? Uh, no reason why it shouldn't work. We're increasingly we're seeing more and more of this mobile bidding going on, and uh, yeah, I've seen it to be fairly effective. There's no reason why you wouldn't accept people's uh, texting, I guess, on the phones if you're set up to do that. But the simplest and easiest way: give people bid cards, have three people ready to record the numbers as the auctioneer is calling off those numbers. It makes it super fast and super easy to execute. Sometimes we tend to complicate things down, you know, with some of this technology and some of this new stuff, and mm -hmm. sometimes the old ways are still the best and the most efficient. Great answer. Yeah, I suppose it always depends on the vendor. Yeah. You know, definitely uh, do your due diligence and, and go out there and check it out. Um, this was a good question from Casey Cook. Uh, the fund of need, uh, cash appeal, part of the live auction? Uh, can be. Yeah. Can be, and if you're going to pre-plan the fund of need and you know that you're going to set up your emotional trigger with a video or whatever, I recommend that you do it right after that most expensive item at the top of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. And here's why. You just sold a trip to Africa, sold it for twenty thousand. You've been up there in high numbers, ten thousand, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen thousand. Been talking big numbers. 
Now we can say, folks, the African trip is sold. Just before we get on to the next premium items that we have in tonight's live auction, we'd like to take a short minute to do our fund a need or fund an item or cash appeal. And to kick that off, I direct your attention to the video screens. We have a short two and a half or three minute video for you to enjoy. Get that emotional trigger. Show the video, get the emotional trigger. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see that we're raising money for this important piece of medical equipment. Tonight, can I ask, is there anybody here that would uh, make a pledge of $5,000? How about $2,500? How about $1,000? We drop it down like that. You've got your three people recording those bit card numbers just as quick as they're being called out. And quick, quick note about videos, too. If you're going to put videos um, and use that as your emotional trigger, make sure they are short and impactful. If it's any longer than a minute and a half or two minutes, um, there should be a very good reason why it is such. Uh, keep it short and keep it impactful. Otherwise, well, good yeah. point, Ian. You know, I we always tell people no longer than three minutes. But, you know, you consider that the 6 o'clock news, they tell a complete story in about 60 to 90 seconds. Yep. So get a good video producer. Yep. Nobody likes to sit there. And I'll tell you this, a five-minute video feels like a 20-minute video. It totally does. It totally does. So keep them short. Keep the speeches short. Keep things tight. Impactful. Emotional trigger. Um, and is there any difference when you're closing a sound auction uh, with mobile bidding versus just regular bid sheets? I don't think so. We always recommend that you close the silent auction. It doesn't matter how you close it, whether you're using the mobile device or whether you're using the actual bid sheets. Never close it during the live auction. You don't want to distract people's attention. We always recommend that you start closing your silent auction right after the live auction. So what we like to do is we'll finish the live auction. We'll say, folks, we're going to start closing the silent. The red section, we'll close that in 10 or 15 minutes. Now, here's an important point that we should share with everybody, Ian. You don't need a half an hour between closing your sections. There's a, a misconception out there. People think the longer we have, the more bidding is going to happen. And that does not happen. What we want to do is we want to create what we call compression on all of those silent auction tables. So we're going to close the green section. Now we're going to say, folks, we're going to close the red section next in 10 minutes. We want everybody to move from the green section over to the red section, create that compression. You know, they've only got 10 minutes. That gets the competitive bidding going. And in 10 minutes, we're going to close it. And when we create compression, we create higher prices in the silent auction. Cool. As far as uh, the bid sheets and the values, um, is it have you ever heard of it being illegal not to put the value on it? And is there items where you oh, would put the value on it? I think those are the more subjective ones. Maybe speak a little bit more about putting value on the, the bid sheets. What about a, a minimum reserve? Do you put well, a, I just saw an interesting question fly by there, and it said, is it illegal to not put values on a silent auction sheet? I've never heard of that. Okay. Uh, and even if it is, what's the worst they're going to uh, that's Pierce. Susan Pearson. She's in Canada, though. Can I know I you execute you? Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have capital punishment in Canada, so yeah. you're, you're fine. <laughs> That's worse can happen. You get a ticket. Right. No, yeah, I yeah. think what she may be thinking about, uh, sometimes um, I know the tax department uh, in Canada uh, will allow you to write off a portion uh, of your purchase price on a live auction item, maybe the silent two, if you state the value, but it needs to increase by at least 25% or something over the stated value of the item, and then you could write off a portion of that 25%. There's some complicated tax things. We just don't get too involved in any of that. But, but uh, anyway, you were asking? Yes. I mean, what about uh, putting a res uh, putting a minimum bid? What do you suggest is the minimum bid for a silent auction? Don't items? make it too high. Uh, we suggest never more than 50% of the retail value of the item. Got so it. if you put it too high, you'll discourage people from, from getting bidding on it. So and bidding increments? And people, bid increments always critical. Make sure they're on your silent auction bid sheet. You don't want people nickel and diming and somebody beating out a previous bidder by $1 or $2. Right. That's chicken. Right. You know, and you they're there to support the cause. So minimum bid increments, five, ten, or twenty dollars. And in my book, we and also on the uh, Winspire site, we show you what we call um, uh, pre-printed bid sheets. They've got the templates, the templates yeah, yeah. where we've got the pre-printed bid increments mm -hmm. on the sheet. Those work like magic. Absolutely. So you'll see an item and there's there, you've got the space for people to put their bid card number or their name and then you've got the bid price at $100. The next box is $125, $150, $175 and so forth. And that really keeps people bidding generously. This is, um, this is a great question from Bridget Ling. Uh, for a fund of need or cash appeal, do you suggest having one item to focus on or a more general appeal to support your organization? I imagine that's, you know, is it to support a specific thing, uh, maybe, a, uh, you know, a, a machine for a hospital or something like that? I would say that most of the time, if you can attach it to something, a particular need or an initiative, you'll be more successful than if we're just trying to raise general funds. 
How many silent auction items do you recommend based on the number of attendees? We always say one to one and a half items per couple. Yep. So take your crowd, divide it by two, and that's the number of wallets yep. that you have, or buying units. Some auctioneers refer to them as buying units Absolutely. that you have in your room. So you have 200 guests, you have 100 buying units in there, and uh, you know, and some people would say, oh, so one item for every couple, that seems like a lot. What your, I guess it depends on the quality of your silent auction as well. And you're always trying to create what we call a seller's market, not a buyer's market. And if you have too many items for the people in the in the room, you create a buyer's market and your average price is going to drop. If you have fewer items in the silent auction, you create a seller's market because now we have low supply, high demand, that's going to push your prices up. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you have enough items that you've captured as much money as people were willing to spend in the silent auction, if that makes sense. So it's it's not a science. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of art here, but just use your common sense. Yeah, we have a great question or a great article actually on Winspire News. If you type in Winspire Buyer's Market, uh, it covers all about making sure that you don't have a buyer's market at your silent auction. Um, trying to get that that delicate balance there. Uh, let's see. Uh, bidding by text. Uh, have an impact on the live auction. Yeah, we're not seeing a lot of that. I mean, that seems to be uh, it seems to be more prevalent in certain regions than others. And I know that a lot of the big uh, galas now and some of the, the medium-sized events are going to the uh, to the tablet bidding. They've got the tablets on mm -hmm. the tables and they're using those to bid. But more in the silent auction than in the live auction. And I don't know if people how they would keep up when the live auction is underway. How they would text fast enough. So I haven't had that experience, so I really can't address that. Um, got a we shouldn't have even mentioned that question. <laughs> they would never have known. Who was that? Who was that? That was uh, Deborah Tyler. Sorry, Deb. Sorry, Deb. Uh, who's, so we got a couple questions about the MC in the event from Chelsea Harmon, Jennifer Frank. Who's the best person to make a cash ask, or who, what should you look for in a speaker? Our hospital administrator is not a dynamic speaker, but the auction benefits that hospital. Um, yeah, I mean that should fall to your MC. Uh, I've seen some, sometimes your media personalities are, yeah. are excellent. They'll look in your community. This is if you choose not to have a benefit auctioneer. Because if you have a benefit auctioneer, they're going to be the best person. They're do. the best person to do the ask if you have the auctioneer. But otherwise, you know, be selective in your and don't pick the first media personality that makes him or herself available. Try and find someone that can uh, get that emotional trigger going. Because yeah, sometimes people use personalities like that to actually draw attendees, which which is definitely something to consider. Uh, one from Christy Godoba, are you suggesting that we keep silent auction open until the live auction is closed? Uh, yes, definitely, but here's another great idea. It's always a, it's, it's a really thing if you've never tried it. Try closing some of your silent auction before people sit down for dinner. So during the cocktail reception, the MC can announce from the stage that folks, we're going to be closing some of the silent auction items. Can't tell you which ones, but we're going to close some of the silent auction items before dinner tonight. What that does is that breaks up your conversation circles, people standing there with a glass of champagne just visiting, gets them out there, getting a pen in hand, and getting them bidding on the silent auction. You don't have to close an entire section. You can use your discretion. You can just pull a few of the silent auction items that weren't generating much for bidding before dinner. And uh, so it, it, it just gets people bidding sooner than later. But yes, the rest of the silent auction flows after the live auction. Great. Uh, and I guess have... if, you, if you insist on putting your live auction later in the evening, then you might want to close your silent before the live auction so you can spit sheets off to the cashier, the cashier so they can start doing their inputting. But uh, again, we highly recommend doing the live auction sooner than later. I've uh, got a good one from uh, Don Albert here. What is a good time frame for having your raffle drawing? Do you recommend a best of yeah. live raffle? Uh, well, best of live, you can do that. That's sometimes they call that the golden ticket raffle, which will let you pick any item uh, on the live auction or maybe off the silent auction tables. If you're not including all of the live auction items, maybe you're including your choice of live auction item, but not the African safari. Make sure people are clear on that. Um, so yes, you can do the, the pick of the uh, auction raffle first, but then the rest of your raffles and door prize giveaways do at the very end of the evening. After you've closed the silent auction, this is a great way to get people back from the silent auction area, back to their seats, settle down, focused, allows your volunteers to pick up those bid sheets, get them out to the cashier so they can start all of the inputting, and you've got something else to engage and entertain the audience 
while they're waiting for that cashier process to take place to help avoid long lineups at the end of the night. Got a quick one here from David Diaz about uh, how do I find a benefit auctioneer specialist? Uh, you go to the National Auction Auctioneer Association website, but also um, our one of our fundraising, any one of our fundraising specialists is happy to refer a benefit auctioneer specialist in your area. So feel free to call us for an event consultation. We'll talk to you about that. Um, I've got another good one about uh, won't um, won't keeping the silent auction. A, a couple about the silent auction closing time. Wouldn't keeping the silent auction open during the live auction distract bidders? Um, if you well, don't, no, it only distracts them if you're closing the silent auction during yeah. the live auction. That's when they're distracted. But if they're told Folks, don't worry. Relax. Sit down. Enjoy the live auction. We won't close any silent auction items till after the live auction. Then it's not a distraction. And if you don't close the silent auction tables until after the live, how will people know what they want so they know how much they can spend the live auction? I guess that doesn't really equate um, necessarily. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I if people are coming, you know, if they have that tight of a budget, I. You know, you need to remember, even though your live auction can account for 30% of your revenue in the night, sometimes more, uh, you're really going to have a very, very few people participating in, in the live auction. You know, my experience has been you get some people that come with right. more money than not, and the people that maybe can't participate in the live auction will focus on the silent and some of the other opportunities you should provide. Yeah, kind of on the tail of that, how do you... Uh prevent everyone from checking out if the silent auction is after the live auction? How do you prevent everyone from checking out before all the bids are recorded? Uh, well, we talked about that. Bring them back yeah. with the raffle draws and your door price. Uh, let's see. Cash appeal. Um, Can you do a cash appeal if we don't have a live auction? Absolutely. Sure. Right? Sure. Uh, our auction is for a school in which eight classes do class projects. Those have traditionally been done as live auction items, but they take up valuable space for higher value items. Would you recommend doing the class projects as super sound auction items? That sounds about right. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. Um, let's see. I think that we're going to go through just a couple more of these questions. Um, Christine Reed, we are a smaller event, 150 participants who have struggled getting bidders to our live event. Our auction is done during our golf outing. How can I sell our event committee on using a professional fundraiser auctioneer? How much does this typically cost? And we have a sponsor who is horribly insisting on leading the auction and has been very uncomfortable. It sounds like an awkward situation, Christine. It is an awkward situation. Yeah. I, you know, there's a couple of ways that I would approach that one. Uh, if you can convince your committee that you're going to do better having a professional fundraising auctioneer who can quarterback that portion of your event, then find somebody to underwrite the cost, somebody to sponsor the cost of bringing in a professional uh, fundraising auctioneer. Yeah. Uh, got one question about, is there too many people for hosting a live auction? Uh, from Heather Hunter, is there a certain amount of people where a live auction becomes too difficult or won't work? We host a 650 person crab feed that we want to do a live auction. Is this too many people? Absolutely not. I've done many events, including the David Foster events, where they have a thousand people in the audience. What you need, at that point, you have to start looking at bringing in professional bid spotters, or as we auctioneers call them, ringmen. And these are uh, people who typically are auctioneers themselves, and they're very, very skilled. They get out into the crowd, and they're watching for the bidders. So the larger your audience, the more uh, professional bid spotters you'll need placed around that room, watching sections of the room. And these bid spotters, when they see a bidder, they holler out, and the auctioneer on the stage can hear that shout, and that's, that's how you handle larger crowds. Here's a great question from Kate Colbert. Any advice about when and how to time the speeches? We have, a gr we have a gala for our domestic violence agency and often have a survivor stand up and speak. Last year we had a 12-year-old boy talk about witnessing violence. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. Our challenge has been that we don't want or don't know how to tie these emotional moments into fundraising. Any tips? Well, oh that right, there's gosh. your emotional trigger. There's your emotional trigger trigger for your cash appeal. Absolutely. So um, if you have that particular type of speaker, that's where you just want to be prepared to launch into your uh, cash appeal. And again, we've done that by giving everybody a bit card number. We have three recorders standing by, ready to record those numbers. And we say we need three recorders because if you have only one. And the auctioneer is calling out bid card numbers very quickly. There can be some some of those numbers can get lost if you have only one person recording. If you have two people recording, there can be a discrepancy between the two recorders. If you have a third person, that settles settles the tie. Settles the tie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just in kind of.
to in that vein, right? Featured speaker timing versus auction timing. Uh, do you have if you have your live auction during dinner, where do you place your keynote speakers talk? Uh, keynote speaker, I would put that before the live auction. You know, ideally your keynote speaker is going to trigger people emotionally and bring awareness to your cause and put those uh, the guests in a frame of mind where they really want to be supportive. The oxytocin is flowing and they're they're ready to engage. So I would definitely have that keynote speaker before the live auction. Right. Any other icebreaker ideas besides the TV? Oh. Got a couple of questions about that. Like what are some other good items? Yeah, whatever you can get. It can be a nice bottle of wine. It can be a bottle of champagne. It can be whatever you can get. You know, uh, what you want is something that has a high perceived value that you can blow out for a ridiculously low price just to get people's attention. So get creative, use your imagination, there's all kinds of things. I had it backfire on me one night, we had a box of chocolates that the town mayor had donated and uh, it was a nice box of chocolates and, and you know I was ready to sell that for two dollars or three dollars. Well we ended up getting three hundred and fifty dollars for the box of chocolates. Wow. Oh. That's pretty good. <laughs> but again it worked because it was entertainment and it engaged the audience. Uh, we don't sell tickets to our event. Uh, it's done as a perk for playing in our golf tournament the next day. Should we try to sell tickets uh, to our ciders? Uh, ticket sales are always good to cover those expenses. There's always going to be expenses at your event, uh, so it's really important to uh, to have some sort of uh, revenue generated that will cover those costs. Um, let's see, I've got any. Is it worth to place people in the crowd to ensure your live auction is a success? This is a good question. Or do you just take a chance that you will have bidders? Oh, yeah. You never want to plant. Well, I shouldn't say you never want to plant. Well, yeah. You know, you never want to plant people that aren't prepared to uh, carry through and commit to, uh, to pay for an item. That, that What if you have a plant out there and that's the only person? I, I've never seen that have to happen, really. You know, I, I don't think it's a good idea. You can get yourself painted into a corner on that, and right. get yourself in some trouble if, if you, the the plant puts his or her hand up at five hundred dollars. Nobody else steps forward. You say sold for five hundred. Now that person's freaking out because they didn't want to <laughs> buy the auction. They were just trying to get. Yeah. You know. Let's see here from Monica Fleming. Most auctions uh, now are handheld bidding, particularly in our area of the country. So no one is going to the silent auction area to peruse. They are just bidding on handhelds. I uh, assume smartphones, so that's why I think guests would be distracted. Huh. Um, okay. Interesting point. Yeah. Um, if you do both list a sound, uh, list an auction and I would, I, a, you know, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. I would just say this. I would say that the people who are engaged in inter or that are interested in the live auction items, they're going to be engaged, and they're not going to be on those silent item tablets. You know, I would think that you know a lot of people at these events come as couples. So I have seen it where, you know, the wife might be on the tablet, you know, working with, on the silent auction, the husband's paying attention to the live auction. So Great. I don't think it has to be an issue. Awesome. Um, I think that is just about it. If, if anyone else has uh, got a lot of um, kind of repetitive questions here, but let's see, one more from Jackie Ham. Uh, what do you recommend for a lunchtime auction with no alcohol? Well, get alcohol in there. Yeah, get alcohol in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm uh, just kidding. Uh, you don't need alcohol, and you know what? Alcohol is a, a slippery slope, and lots of times organizers say, "Oh no, we want to do the auction later, so they have time to get drinks and drink some wine and get loosened up." That can backfire on you because there's a fine point where when is enough alcohol enough? And yeah, maybe it relaxes people early in the evening, but I don't want them once they're drunk and the crowd's out of control. It's it's more difficult to control the table chatter and to hold people's attention. So I'm happy to do an event where there is no alcohol. Absolutely. Right. All right. Uh, unless there's any other questions uh, from you guys out there. Uh, oh, we, oh I, I actually got a couple here about the Buy It Now. What do you think of Buy It Now bidding on silent auction items? Uh, works great, but at the Buy It Now, what this uh, individual, Christy, is referring to uh, are the pre-printed bid sheets that have a what they call a Buy It Now, and you really can't call it Buy It Now because that is, uh, what's that registered? It's a copyright issue. Copyright with uh, eBay. eBay, right. So you can't call it Buy It Now. So I call it a walk-away bid. Yep. And a walkaway bid sheet is set up so is that there is a... We call ours a buy now. We just say buy now. Okay, buy now. Yeah. So it's, it's a bid. I recommend that that buy now price at the bottom of the sheet is 150%. 150% of the retail value of the item. And you might be asking yourself right now, well, who would pay 150% more than what an item is worth? Well, often these, these um, walkaway bids work well for people who can't stay the entire evening and they want to make sure that they get the item. 
so yeah, they work really good, and they can increase your uh, silent auction results by anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. So they're worth looking into. And again, my book has a complete explanation, as does the Windspire site on the uh, walkaway bid sheets. Great. Yep, we've got a couple. Uh, yep, we're going to wrap it up here. Just want to say that I've uh, got plenty of questions about uh, getting the recording of this, which we're going to be sending out uh, to you guys a little bit later this week. I just want to say thank you so much, uh, first and foremost, to all of you for coming out and joining us for this uh, webinar event. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting this. And then, of course, uh, thank you, Danny Hoover, for, uh, for coming and joining us here at the Windspire headquarters and, uh, and serving up some, some serious uh, cherry auction knowledge. So it's been, it's been wonderful. Well, thanks, Ian. And once again, if anybody wants to reach me, I've got a great website. Cooper.com. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, just a real pleasure to be working uh, here at Winspire in California. So thanks, Melania. All right, thank you guys so much. We'll uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.